Okay. So we're back. So um, the next thing that I do uh, is I continue to the the fitness screening, and I start with blood pressure. Uh, high blood pressure is one of the leading causes of uh, contributing causes of death in uh, in America today. Uh, they call it the silent killer because it has no symptoms until it gets to its advanced stages and ready to put you in bed or put you away. So it's, it's very important that you keep track of your blood pressure. Uh, there are electronic units, a lot of those are battery operated units, and there's the old stethoscope and being from the old school, I actually prefer the uh, the stethoscope and there's uh, but you can't take your blood pressure with a stethoscope unless you have what we call a self-taking unit which actually attaches this stethoscope to the cuff so that you don't need three hands in order to, to take your blood pressure but uh, I have personally found that that uh, the uh, uh, electronic units typically will show readings about 10 uh, points or 10 millimeters of mercury higher uh, than the on the systolic pressure than I get with the uh, taking the blood pressure with the stethoscope and so I, I prefer the uh, uh, stethoscope but uh, it's just very difficult to find good ones today without going in into some incredible levels of, of expense and, and and particularly the self-taking unit it's very difficult to find I've gone through a number of companies uh, uh, who I found have just watered down the whole self-taking blood pressure unit market. And so I look for uh, an electronic unit that I find is most reliable. If it's 10 points higher, then we can make an adjustment for that as long as it's consistently 10 points higher. The best model for that I found is this particular machine that I'm using is called a, a MicroLife. And I got these, at, this is a Costco uh, a purchase and but it's it's been very consistent uh, I have a way to actually calibrate uh, the, uh, the the old stethoscope uh, units this big bomanometer uh, using a, a system that was provided for me by a man who I found uh, accidentally uh, who prepares or repairs blood pressure equipment used on ambulances and uh, he was so pleased that somebody inquired about how do you calibrate these these blood pressure units that he uh, he actually gave me the setup that showed me how to actually calibrate my own and and I've uh, gone through the certification program for blood pressure taking with the Red Cross uh, several times and actually have had students uh, uh, from uh, Lewis and Clark College come through my program uh, as interns and I, one of the things that requires they get first a certified as a uh, professional uh, at, uh, at blood pressure uh, taking uh, through the American Red Cross. But interestingly enough, when I asked the American Red Cross, how do you guys calibrate break your blood pressure units? They said, what? <laughs> they didn't know, didn't have a clue as to how blood pressure units are calibrated. So I figured I may, I may be one of the few persons in, in, in the city of Portland that um, actually know how to calibrate blood pressure units. But as long as it's, it, you have an electronic unit that is consistently uh, 10 points off, then, then we, can, uh, we can live with that and just make an adjustment in the way we interpret the scores. So the microlife blood pressure unit, and this is the cuff, and uh, we put the cuff on and looking for a brachial artery which you need to feel around for and for some reason I find that uh, the women tend to be a little bit more off-center uh, to the inside of the arm than men do for some reason but you'll find a lot of these little idiosyncrasies when you do enough enough testing getting the the uh, uh, arrow down in line with what would be the brachial artery or that that finger uh, uh, inside your hand your, your pinky finger and get that in line with that. Tighten up the cuff. Don't make it too tight, or it will tend to make you feel like uh, your body's blowing up as you pump up the cuff. And then get the the reading going. Just wait on it. You ideally want to have this arm 
about the height of your heart. So if you can find a table with that height, which is rare, uh, then you're you're probably getting the most uh, accurate position. So um, uh, wait until the cuff fills up. Now some people you'll get a, a reading of the resting of the resting heart rate or the heart rate and the blood pressure. And some people will use this as a way to try to determine their exercise heart rate, which is a bad idea. Because when you stop exercising in order to do this, your heart rate's coming down. And by the time this thing uh, pumps up and, and gives you a reading, uh, your heart rate has changed so much from what it was while you were exercising that it's not usable information. So this is not a good way to test your exercise heart rate or heart rate while exercising, okay? Um, and uh, so I get my reading and then I re record those numbers. Now the first reading is almost always uh, a higher reading than the second reading. And so I always do it twice uh, with the with these with these units. Um, let's see here, I'm gonna write this down just for my personal records. And I write down the time of day that this reading was taken because these are factors that may determine uh, what your what your reading is. Uh, certain times of day, you personally, because of different habits that you have, may have a, a higher or lower reading than at other times of day. So you want to make your, sure you're testing under the same circumstances every time. We call it reliability in fitness research. In research, you need to try to create the same circumstance in which you did the particular test that you're doing uh, so that you can repeat it the next time. Now on the, the second reading, it will tend to drop down. But if I take test it a third time in a row, uh, it tends to go up. So keep records of this type of information and it will help you to do a better job of weeding out uh, little things that can get in the way of the accuracy of the information that you're accumulating on yourself. Okay, all right, so it went down slightly. Okay, so that's how the blood pressure is taken. Uh, the next thing, uh, if we don't accept this resting heart rate is we would take the resting heart rate manually, which you should know how to do anyway. And that way you can compare your manual reading with any uh, machine or any other situation that's taking your blood pressure. So simple way to do it is to find your pulse at the base of your thumb, put your two fingers on that, that pulse, just wait. And you may have to bend the wrist backwards to, to, to get that pulse uh, up close to, to, the, to the skin and uh, count the pulse for 15 seconds and multiply the beats by four, okay? If that's difficult for you, you may try it on your throat, right on the side of your throat, your carotid pulse, uh, two, two fingers in, don't press in too hard. Uh, there's an Adam's apple right on the side of your Adam's apple, you press in lightly uh, there, you can feel that pulse. Some people say it's easier if you take your thumb, put it at the corner of your jaw, and then pull your fingertips across to the side there so that pulse will will uh, show up right at, at your fingertips. And count again for 15 seconds and multiply by four, write that score down. The goal is, and we start filling out the, the sheet here, the yellow sheets for women, the blue sheets for men. And on here, it shows the events, the testing events that we're doing and what a passing score is, your initial score and then uh, eight weeks of testing and what the scores are as a result of the things that you do. And it's amazing what you will learn. It is fascinating when you really start to find out how your body starts to work. Talk about exercise being fun, not so much. But testing, oh yeah, at, at least learning what's happening with your body and how your body responds to things like certain foods. Uh, may impact your score. A cup of coffee may shoot this reading up 10 or 20 points uh, immediately. You know? So uh, it, it can really educate you as to what works for you and, and what may be a challenge for you just because you know how to measure the consequences uh, of your choices. So uh, you know how to take your resting heart rate, you have your blood pressure information there. And then the next thing 
that uh, I do is the flexibility. And the reason I do the flexibility at this point in the, in the testing process is because there are things in the program that will actually affect your flexibility score. Uh, certain strength tests might impact your flexibility score. The step test for cardiovascular fitness will for, for sure negatively impact your flexibility score. So, so I take the flexibility score at this point and I'm not gonna demonstrate that right now because it involved me getting on the floor and the camera won't be able to follow me because I don't have anybody to hold the camera. Uh, and, uh, and so I'm just going to just explain that it's sitting on the floor, reaching with your fingers extended, your legs straight, uh, at least five inches past your toes for men or 20 inches past your toes for women. That information is all explained on my fitness testing uh, DVD for those of you who are not isotopic exerciser users. And for those of you who are exercise, isotopic exerciser users, uh, there's my DVD coach, which has the uh, uh, not only the fitness testing but also the instructions uh, on how to use the isotopic exerciser uh, in your in the basic program but this information is available to you on DVD so that you will know how to do that flexibility test uh, the next test then is the step test uh, with the step test uh, it's also on the DVD step up and down on a 16 accord inch step uh, an 8 inch step uh, or a 12 inch step for three consecutive minutes, take the pulse for 15 seconds, multiply the beats by four. All the instructions for that are on the, on the DVD. Then uh, the next thing is body fat. I wanna know not so much your weight, but your body fat percentage. In the uh, original form of this test back in 1979, uh, when I developed it, uh, along with Dr. Tony Evans from Lewis and Clark College, uh, the uh, weight was eliminated because I thought there was an overemphasis on weight as an indication of fitness and perhaps even health to some extent. Um, but, uh, and so I, I took the weight issue out and said, let's just look at fat. It's not so much the weight alone that kills you, it's the fat that kills you. Uh, some people are healthier at, at a higher weight, particularly if their fat percentage is down. This particularly happens with athletes. So a lot of the, the focus is on weight punishes muscle, which is the thing that you wanna have uh, in order to be healthy and certainly in order to be physically fit. So I just uh, did to concentrate on fat percentage and using the Lang skin fold calipers, I was able to get within eight tenths of a percent of underwater weighing scores using this device at clinics that I did on estimating body fat uh, for physicians and coaches uh, in the Portland area. Uh, if you don't have a skin fold caliper, find yourself a tape measure because I found that if you're losing inches but you're not losing pounds, you are probably losing fat, and that's a, that's a good thing. The one lady, remember, started a 15-mile-a-week jogging program with lightweight training, expecting weight loss. She gained eight pounds and dropped six dress sizes because muscle is heavier than fat and takes up less space. It's been said that for every pound that, of muscle that you add, you increase your caloric expenditure by 50 calories a day. Well, that's better than a diet. Uh, so uh, keep track of your body shape. Uh, the, the key area that I'm concerned about with women is the hip area. I found uh, if you're dropping body fat, you almost always are dropping your hips. So you, uh, measure your hip measurement and see if your measured body fat level uh, is actually agreeing with your hip uh, measurement. Uh, it should be reducing uh, if your legitimate your fat uh, score is legitimate. For men, that measurement is the waistline. If a man is dropping body fat, he almost always is dropping his waistline measurement. And the waistline men is not where we wear our pants. We wear our pants a couple inches lower than the waistline. We measure right across the navel, that's oh, the, the measurement that we want. And the next thing that I do after body fat and measurements is I measure strength. And I do that electronically, uh, have an electronic strain gauge with norms established by Dr. Barry Brown at the University of Arkansas, who helped us develop the testing program and the workouts uh, that we do to in order to, in order to change the scores, uh, for, uh, particularly for, for those using the isobobic exerciser program. So uh, 
And once we've gone through all of these tests, then we sit down and we have what we call an interpretation session. Interpretation session is the point where uh, we have you copy your scores so that you have a copy and I have a copy. We can call up and talk about these scores on the phone. You can tell me what you're doing for exercise or not doing for exercise and I will be able to, to interpret um, what you're doing and uh, the positive or negative impact or no impact that it's having on your, your, your fitness level and then make some recommendations based upon that. And so we have you copy your score, you have a copy, I have a copy, and then we go over the test. When we go over the test, what we do is we look at each uh, particular area of the test. And what I want to do at that point is to tell you oh, what I believe your body is saying as a result of that particular test. Anything related to the cardiovascular system is saying that your heart, lungs, and arteries are not pumping blood as efficiently as we would like them to. So if your rest, if your resting heart rate is is uh, not dropped, then it probably means that the amount of blood that you pump in a single beat or the stroke volume of the heart has not improved, which means you you, you haven't strengthened that heart and that system enough to, to bring about the change. You may you may want to modify the workout by changing the intensity, duration, and frequency of what you call aerobic exercise and in order to get a better result. Um, strength scores uh, are another thing, flexibility are another thing, but it's, again, just fascinating the lessons that you'll learn as a result of, as a result of doing this. So, um, so once you, you uh, interpret the, the, uh, the scores, then we look at what your, again, we wanna rehash your goal and make sure that we are in agreement in terms of what you say your stated goal is. I know my goal is to have you pass my test because if you pass this test, then my contention is that you're physically fit enough to stay healthy, which means is these scores will help you to impact your resistance to heart disease, bad back, diabetes, cold, flu, cancer, uh, the 80% of the health problems today that are being traced to poor exercise habit and lack of physical fitness. So my goal is to pass my test but people will come to me and they have other goals. Like one lady said, look, I want this hip measurement down, hip area down, and if I can't get that, I don't care about this other stuff. Well, you know, that's, that's fine. But we have to come to some agreement about what it is we're doing because it's, it's just no fun when you go away uh, totally dissatisfied with the results, which may be from a health standpoint, Excellent, but like it's, they say, there's some people that wouldn't care if they died tomorrow as long as they look good today. So, so we have to acknowledge that there are differences and then see if we can come to some uh, agreement about what really is important. But most people, uh, when they understand the health impact uh, and implications of their test scores, have no problem with, uh, with deciding, okay, well, I'll work a bit harder, particularly if it's something that doesn't take a lot of time, is not inconvenient, uh, maybe no stiff, the stiffness and soreness, and we can avoid a lot of those areas, which is what I try to do with the programs that I design. Uh, great things can happen in your fitness program. So the interpretation, and then we, again, just rehashing, what is your goal? What do you want to have happen? What would please you? How would you define success? Uh, you know, a lot of people say, I just want general fitness. Uh, that's, that's fine. Uh, I want to improve my endurance. I want to improve my strength. I want to shape my body. Fine. Let's see if we can do that in addition to making you healthy and give you a program that you can do for the rest of your life. But it starts with testing. Now, how often should you test? Well, I tried that uh, a lot of different ways. When I got into this industry, the, the belief in, in the fitness community at the time was that any fitness testing done uh, in less than six months is a waste of time because you can't change your fitness scores that rapidly. Well, I quickly found that that wasn't true. Uh, you can change the fitness scores quite rapidly, particularly if you're doing the right things. Uh, uh, but I started testing my clients uh, every 60 days. And uh, uh, that was virtually worthless. There, there's just no exercise compliance with testing every 60 days. I tried testing every 30 days and same thing, 90% of people would discontinue their exercise program if they had to wait 60 days, or 30 days between tests. 
And so I changed it to every two weeks, which is radical. Nobody tested every two weeks. What kind of results do you expect in, in only two weeks? Well, I found that there were results in, in only two weeks between tests. And not only that, um, that only 50% of people would drop out of their program as opposed to 90% if I waited 30 days. So I said, wow, that's interesting. So I played with that one for a while. And then I said, well, I wonder what would happen if I tested every week. Whoa! Testing every week, at least 90% of the people who were participating in the program uh, and, and, and testing weekly would actually comply. They would stick with their exercise program. So the dropout rate uh, decreased. The, their commitment to the program increased because we were able to correct problems uh, and misapplications of exercises uh, very quickly. Uh, if you wait three weeks between tests, it only takes 21 days to develop a, a habit. So you could develop a new bad habit in 21 days if you wait that long between tests. But if you get fresh feedback about how your exercise program is affecting you uh, every seven days, then man, you got something that you can make adjustments to and, and just get really excited about it. So this is the way I, I approach uh, uh, fitness testing, and I'll be doing more on this, but this is where it starts, and the idea is to give you the feedback that you need. I found a 90% compliance rate, and this continues. I have people who've been doing this for over 30 years, and uh, the compliance rate holds up as long as we have the accountability. People don't do what you expect. They do what you inspect. So inspect your fitness level once a week and watch these great things happen. And the next thing that we talk about from here is what are we going to do for exercise? So uh, we'll talk about that uh, on another tape and, uh, and we'll see you then.